Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. I already had a lecture uh, for two hours with some atheists. <laughs> and he did not agree to film it. Chabad. It will be a great hit. So, before I start the lecture, I know that many people in, over the years, they told you I'm an atheist, I'm an atheist, I'm an atheist. I work 27 years in this field. I give lectures all over the world, Baruch Hashem. After I got old, as you can see, I already saw everything. And I'm telling you, with one million percent guarantee, there's not one atheist person in the world. Guarantee, not one. It's very easy to say I'm an atheist. That means in English, leave me alone. I'm not interested to keep Shabbat. I'm not interested to be religious. I'm not interested to eat kosher. And I'm not interested to dress modest. Because I'm afraid to become religious, the easiest way out is to say, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in this nonsense. Uh, leave me alone. No problem. Leave you alone. Leave you alone. But I promise you there's not one atheist. And you know what it means, atheist? An atheist come and say, like the guy that argued with me earlier today, I asked him, do you think that the brain of a human being with 10 trillion connections, size of an apple, if you take all the internet network and all the cellular phone network and all the landlines all over the world, the entire system of 8 billion people it's not even 1% of a brain of one human being. And it's all in jail. It's wires in jail. They're, it's so sophisticated. It will take a billion years to design such a thing. And you have 8 billion people. And you have 2 million different animals. 2 million different animals. And each species has billions of them. So there is hundreds of billions of brains in the world. And they all function, and there's a heart who pump blood into the brain, and the blood goes into these veins, and the size of these little wires, it's one thousandth of an hair. Take one hair out of your head, take one thousand out of these wires, it's equal to one hair. Do you really think I ask him that something like this was made by a random explosion? What does he say? It's possible. I'm sorry, you need to be hospitalized in a mental institution. <laughs> That's my opinion. I, I asked the audience, anyone would want this guy to be son-in-law? <laughs> no. I say, you're not normal. Say, there is a creator. He runs the show. I don't want anything to do with him. Leave me alone. I want to be an animal. I want to eat, I want to drink, I want to have a relationship with anyone I want. I want to live my life. Don't tell me what to do. I'm not interested in you. You want to kill me? Kill me. You want to keep me alive? Keep me alive. Don't tell me what to do. Be honest at least. Why am I making lies? Say, everything is true. I'm not interested to be religious. Then we'll, we'll talk in a different way. I have to, I have to waste my time two and a half hours to prove to you that there's a God? So the answer is, Rabotai, just like you all know, there's this bottle of water, right? That's from the mental institution. So... How did my wife present us to you? <laughs> I tell you what she said. She said that nah, she didn't. I'll tell you a joke. <clears throat> One guy, he went to buy a brain. His brain stopped to work. So he came to the brain shop. And the doctor over there, he said to him, you see this brain? is half a million dollars. He said, what's so special about his brain? He said, that's the brain of a teacher. A brain of a teacher. I said, wow, half a million dollars? I'll be smart like a teacher. <laughs> he said, yes. And he said, what about this one? He said, 750,000. What's that? 
It's a brain of an Israeli jet pilot, F-16 pilot. The Israeli pilots are brilliant. What about this brain? He said, ah, that's the diamond. What? One million dollars. One million dollars? What's the brain? It said it's a brain of a Kurdi guy. <laughs> Kurdi. He said, Kurdi? One million? He said, yeah, it's brand new. It's never thought before. <laughs> Some people have brains like this, never thought before. <laughs> By the way, to be stupid it's a sin. You should know that. No one is really born stupid. You can get out of it. It's not a curse. It's not a decree. You practice and you become smart, just like if you're not an athlete, you can learn to be an athlete. <laughs> Everything in life we did, we learn to be. Some people said, leave me alone, I'm stupid, and that's the way it is. That's not true. <clears throat> I saw people that really were not smart and became smart. With a lot of effort. Of course, everyone is born with a different talent. But it, talent can be developed. So, Abotai, you see this battle? Do you know one secular person in the world that will swear that this battle was made by itself without a designer? You all know the answer. Everybody knows. You see this bottle, you know there's a factory who made that bottle. With a sticker, with lights, with colors, with green, with, with all kinds of letters. It's designed in such a way that it won't slide from your hand. There is a, there is a little hole in the bottom that it will stand steady. So we have a rule. If there is a creation, there is a creator. You don't find a symmetric creation with lots of thoughts and plan that was meant by an explosion. There's no such thing. So if there is a creation, there is a creator. The more sophisticated the creation is, the more sophisticated is the creator, right? To make this cup of uh, plastic cup, you don't have to be a genius to learn how to do it in a day. To make this microphone, maybe a week. To make this camera, maybe a month. To make a, a spaceship, maybe a year. So the more sophisticated... <laughs> oh, what's gonna be now? It's like that. That's it? Like yeah, this? Yeah, it's like wow. <laughs> Between the dog that barks and this, the big people. Anyway, so... One time I gave a lecture in Israel in a moshav of Yemenite people. You know, the most stubborn people in the world are Temanim. To convince a Temani, you win automatically a Nobel Prize. There's no way to convince a Temani. I used to have a Hevruta in Yeshiva Temani. I just want to move forward. I say, you're right, you're right. Just <laughs> let's move on. Otherwise, it will be a week, the argument. So I was speaking in this moshav of the Temanim, and there was maybe 20 dogs behind the, the wall barking the entire lecture. They never saw such thing. Wow, 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 <laughs> for two hours like this. And I usually, when there is a noise, I lose my mind. I don't know how I survive. Okay, anyway, we move on. So if there is a creator, there is a cre if there is a creation, there is a creator. The more sophisticated is the creation, it shows us about the ability of the Creator. Okay, step number three. Can you find one thing in the world that was created without a purpose? Anything. A napkin, a towel, a phone, a microphone, a cup, a rug, a table, lights, projector, anything you ever saw. If you come to the one who designed it and made it, you ask him, why did you make this projector? I don't know. Why did you make this video camera? I have no idea. Why did you make this tower? I really don't know. Is it possible? No. Everyone that made something, you ask him, why did you make it? He'll tell you right away, because I wanted this and this and that. Right? I wanted to see my lecture later on in a repeat. I made a video camera. I wanted to see a movie on a screen. I made a project. I wanted people to use my cup and throw it away. So I made a plastic cup. 
I want people to clean their hands and sweat. So I made a towel. Everything has a purpose. Now what came first? The will of the Creator or the purpose? What came first? I'll give you an example. A person has a dark room. He wants light in the old days when there was no light bulbs. Newton. There's, I can't see anything at night. I have to fix that problem. So he had a will. What was his will? That at night he'll be able to read. In the old days, they didn't have, they didn't have light bulbs. They had candles. It's very hard to read in candles, you know, and wind. This. So he wanted to fix that problem. So he had, a, he had a will. What was his will? To create light at night. Right? And then, after he wanted the light, he started all these things and he made a light bulb. What was the purpose of the light bulb? To create light. Okay, so every creation has a purpose. So far, you agree with me? Okay, next step. Is it possible to find any item that was made in the world without instructions how to use it and why, what it was made for? If you buy a laptop, it comes with a book. How to use it and what's the purpose of the laptop? What you can do with that? Graphic, video... Right? It's always an explanation. You buy a chair, they explain to you how to put it together and how you can use it. Everything. A car has a, has a booklet bigger than the Bible. You need a year to, to learn what your car has to offer. Who reads it? Nobody knows the feature of the car. So the answer is, is it possible that the creator of the world made such a world and the world does not have a purpose? The, uh, the answer is absolutely not. The world has a purpose. Now we have to find out what's the purpose. So the next question is, is it possible the creator of the world made such a world with so many people and so many animals and so many galaxies and he will not tell anyone in the world what's the purpose of the creation? So what's the point? No one would know what's the purpose of life. It's very unlikely. Until now, everything I told you has nothing to do with Judaism. It's simple common sense. Jew, non-Jew. The non-Jews also ask what's going on in this world. One thing we do know. What is the most sophisticated creation in this world? The human being. Anybody here has a doubt that the most important thing in a creation is the human being? He controls the whole material, he controls the animal, he controls everything. He controls the fruit, the tree, the, the vegetables, the animals, everything, every raw material, diamonds, metal, gold, everything was made for the human being, right? Gold was made for who? For the human being. Diamonds for the human being. Food for the human being. Animals for the human being. Cows, sheep, milk. Everything was made for us, even lions, tigers, we control them all. So now we understand that the most important thing in the creation is the human being and everything that was made in the world was made for him. The question is, the human being still does not know what's the purpose of his creation. Now, remember, we are not talking religion yet. Every one of you, religious or not religious, I'm sure you thought about these things at least once in your life. What am I doing here? Who made me? What is my goal in life? Where do I have to be in 20 years from now? What's going to happen when I die? There's a lot of questions. Now let's try to find the purpose of life without religion. Let's, I'll do it for you. I'll save you time. I did it hundreds of times. <laughs> so I asked many people in the world, what's the purpose of life? I'll tell you all the answers I heard. One, to get married and have children. For that, you can have been a monkey. <laughs> you don't need to be a human being. Monkeys love their babies. They play with them. Okay, so it's not it. Okay, so to become wealthy, successful in business, make millions. 90% of the people in the world are poor. Go to some countries, people can barely have a piece of bread a day. Don't look at New York, I don't know, Montreal, uh, Beverly Hills. Most of the people in the world barely have what to eat. Look at all the Arab countries, look at Africa. 
<coughs> so if the purpose of life was to enjoy life and to have all the money in the world and enjoy what the world has to offer, then the Creator will give this to all people. Why? To one person, yes, and to nine, no. So that's not the purpose. So maybe the purpose is to be healthy, to watch your health. But most people in the world have at least one sickness. Sugar, heart condition, this, that, all kinds of problems. So that's not the purpose. So what's the purpose? Maybe to be educated. For what? What's the purpose of education? To make money? The dumbest people in the world are billionaires. Did you ever see Mike Tyson? <laughs> Number one idiot on earth. <laughs> and made 30 million dollars in 10 minutes by killing someone. Like a murderer. Boom, boom, boom. Ah, person is dead. 30 million. <laughs> so that's not the purpose. Maybe the purpose is to enjoy nature, to look at the world, to, to experiment, to look at the views. You could have been an eagle. You don't have to wait, corona, mask, wait online, 20 different checks, PCR test, vaccine, you cannot come in, an eagle, fly all over the world for free business class. <laughs> so that's not the purpose. Bottom line, to make a long story short, I tried everything. Every possibility that secular people would bring, I, did. I demolished in a second. It cannot be. So until now, it was just a logical argument. Nothing to do with religion. Now comes the religion into the picture. When I say religion, there's only one religion in the world. It's Judaism. There's 80,000 religions and cults who came later, but they're all fairy tales. How do I know? Not because I have anything against them. It wouldn't bother me if there would be 50 different religions and they're all true. Let everybody be happy in his own religion and fine. I don't have anything against them because they are Christian or because they are Muslim or Hindus or Buddhists. Nothing to do with that. We are searching for the truth. And in the truth, you cannot be a politician. Once you become a politician, you will never reach the truth because politicians say to the public what the public wants to hear. I'm not here tonight to tell you what you like to hear because that's going to be a scam. I'm here to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. If I'm going to start to give you what you want to hear, you're all going to be smiling and happy and hug me in the end of the lecture. And in the end, you won't achieve any progress. If I'll tell you what you need to hear, it may bother you. But it's a very good sign. It's a very good sign. Just like the doctor said to his patients, you need an open heart surgery. It's terrible news. But in this news, it means that if without this, if you wouldn't come to me today, tomorrow you'll be dead. Tomorrow you'll be dead, and now I'm giving you life back. It will hurt maybe two or three months, but you will be able to live another 50 years. So the idea is that changes are not comfortable. Even if you're a lawyer in a firm making 100,000 a year, and a competitive firm offer you 300,000, to move from here to there, it's difficult. Different secretary, different subway, different... Uh, it's a different coffee machine, a different boss, a lot of differences. It takes time to adjust. But he's happy because he's making three times more. Religion <coughs> scares people, but really for no reason. I am someone who knows both sides very, very well. I grew up in a non-religious life, and I live in a very religious life today. Plus, I come in contact with very not religious people all the time. But I know all kinds of secular people, Jews and non-Jews, rich and poor, smart and stupid, successful and failures. So I know all kinds of people. I give lectures in the houses of the most powerful people in the world. Very big people. I had a debate with the controller of New York State for three hours. All the money of New York State in his hand. Billions of dollars he has to sign 
FBI, Fire Department, the schools, the union. It's such a big shot. More money than the state of Israel multiplied by three in his signature. Three hours, one on one. He even came to one of my lectures, arguing with me in public for 45 minutes. Also professor for history. Also the best friends of President Kennedy that was murdered. Was in the same class with him. A real brilliant secular guy. Not those fools who never read the Torah once in their life. He knew a lot. And he made such a great argument. And in the end, after three hours, he got up. And he said, you know, all my life, when I debated him, he was 68 years old, he said, all my life, I thought religion is a matter of belief, faith. You want to believe? You believe. You don't want to believe? It's up to you. It it's never can be proven. Today, you prove to me beyond any doubt there is a God, and the Torah is divine, and there is life after death. Everything I thought it's a matter of faith, it's crystal clear to me. I ask him, what are you going to do with that? He said to me, I should have met you 30 years ago. It's a little bit too late for me, 68 years old. Where will I start? My whole life is a mess. I just found out my wife is not Jewish. I just found out through you that my children are not Jewish. I just found out that every minute of my life was a mistake. Where will I even start? So I told him, you're lucky because God gave a person a chance to fix and change and save his future and his olam haba, his next world, until the last hour of his life. As long as you live, you can fix. It's against nature. It's against all odds. Imagine a person did not pay his electric bill for 20 years. There's some glitch in a computer in the electric company. They never send him a bill. One month, three, three months, six months, a year. He saw, wow, they got, they don't have me in the system. He begins to use electric ten times more, he gives cables to the neighbors, he charged them money, he became a business. Everyone in the neighborhood buy electric from him for half a price. Make millions, celebrate. One day, 20 years later, the FBI knock on his door. Open up. Put your hands behind your head, put your hands behind your back. You're under arrest for stealing twenty million dollars of electric from the electric company. Federal crime. You are subject to twenty years in prison and ten million dollar fine. So he comes in front of the judge and he said to the judge, "Dear judge, of course I committed a sin. I'm ashamed. I'm really, I really regret how I." how I lived in the last 20 years, it's terrible. I realized today my mistake, and I promise you I'm here to fix things. From now on, I will never use electric unless I pay for it. I will disconnect all the cables to the neighbor, and from this moment until the day I die, every electric that I will use, I will pay with no problem. Please let me go. <laughs> The judge will hear such a claim and say, you know what, psychiatric evaluation immediately. <laughs> Let me go. 20 years is still electric, you want to go just like that by promising you won't do it? It sounds like a joke. This joke is reality. The merciful God wrote in the Torah, as long as you live, you can fix. When you will return all the way back to me and listen to my instructions, I will have mercy on you. It's not going to be fair to waive 30, 50 years of sins, obviously billions of sins. Wow, just because you became a, a religious Shomer Shabbat Sadiq and you start giving some donations and you eat kosher and you regret really all the crimes you committed against me and your ungratefulness, I'm giving you oxygen for 50 years and you use it against me, I give you wife and children, and you use it against me, I give you a car and you drive it on Shabbat, I give you money and you buy non-kosher food, and you eat on Yom Kippur, and you eat Hametz and Pesach, and everything I ask you to do, you don't care about me. But you used it against me, and you know what? In one hour I'm willing to forgive you. If you accept never to do it again, you shame of what you did, you regret it, and from now on you fix your way. And you know what? 
everything will be waived. If it's a sincere repentance, where will you find such a deal? If this deal was not on the table, I wouldn't be here tonight. Why? Because it's a waste of time. We all would be a lost case anyway. What's the point of giving you a speech? It's going to take you a million years to fix all the crimes and the sins. Most of the sins you committed in your life, I promise you from experience, you're not even aware that there was a sin. And even if you know that it was a sin, you have no idea how severe is the sin. <clears throat> now remember, when you evaluate your sins and your crimes, you evaluated the way you were educated here in Canada, which is a liberal country, a lefty, just like America, just like Israel, democratic, lefty, liberal countries. The universities became the new God. The professors are the new rabbis. It's a whole different aspect. We don't really care what the world has to say. We only care what the creator of the world has to say. Yes, a lot of smart people make up all kinds of ideas. In the, in the end, we have to see what God say about the crimes of the people, what's serious and what's not. Sometimes if you ask us, you ask a person, are you allowed to steal from rich people and give it to the poor? Some people will say it's a great thing. You're a righteous man. You steal from the rich who make millions and you give it to the poor. Very nice, Robin Hood. The Torah says you're a criminal, you're a thief. We don't go by what feelings say. We go by what the Torah says. That's the difference between a person who follow book of instructions that was given by the creator of the world and someone who make up the rules based on his common sense. <laughs> now, I would go back to the argument I made. So, if there is a creation, there is a creator, it's the most sophisticated it is. It shows about the brilliance of the creation, creator, and we never found a creation without a purpose, and there is no way that something will be made and it has a purpose, and the creator will not bother to tell anyone about it. Then what's the point? No one will not use it. And the most important thing in the world is the human being. And everything was made for the human being. And it's not logical that the Creator will not tell the human being what's his purpose in life. Up to here, it's common sense. From now on, it's Judaism. Comes the Torah, 3,300 years ago. And the Torah said, Torah means in Hebrew, oraot, instructions. Book of Instructions, the Divine Book of Instructions. Today, there are 80,000 religions and cults. We know Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Krishna. Well, most people don't even, can't even name 10 religions. Most people don't know about it. But in the internet, if you look at the list of all the religions and cults, you press the arrow down, until tomorrow it runs. 80,000. <laughs> Every Monday and Thursday, someone make up a cult. David Koresh and this and shooting. Do we have time to check 80,000 religions and cults? Every, some, everyone, every person who make up a cult, I'm going to have to go and examine if they have the truth or not. Obviously, it's a waste of time. So we go to the first original religion. Who can tell me what's the main difference between Judaism to all these 80,000 religions and cults. That makes a whole big difference. What's the main difference that gives us a big pride to be Jewish? That Muslim cannot say it, and a Christian cannot say it, and a Hindu cannot say it, even though by, by numbers they are much more than us. 2 billion Christians, 1.8 billion Muslims, 600 million Buddhists, only 13, 14 million Jews in the world. Peanuts, quarter of a percent. 99.75% of the people in the world are not Jews. The quarter of a percent runs the show. Do you know in the United States, 50% of the doctors are Jewish. How many Jews you have in America? Six million. How many go in? Four hundred million. Four hundred million and six million contributed the same amount of doctors. Make sense? Look at the Nobel Prize winners. So many Jews. You have Chinese. Chinese is close to two billion people. Jews are not one percent of the Chinese. Jews give more Nobel Prize winners than Chinese. 
and any other nation. Everywhere in the world, almost all the inventions in medicine, it's all Jews. All the equipment, Jews. All your iPhones, smart, laptop, cars, all the accessories in your car, stay in lane, it beeps, it stops the car, airbag, all these things, it's all Israeli inventions. Intel, Microsoft, it's all in Israel. Why? There's one verse in the book of God. I will scatter you in all the nations because you don't listen to me. So that's exile, that's a punishment. At the same time, everywhere you're going to be, you will be the center of the place. Everyone will talk about you, everyone will be jealous with you. That's called, in one word, antisemitism. They hate the Jews when they're rich, they hate them when they're poor, they hate them when they're healthy, they hate them when they're sick, they, help. they hate them when they're in Israel or out of Israel, when they own Israel, when they don't own Israel. No matter what, they'll find a reason to hate them. Why? It's a verse in the God's book. There's nothing you can do about it. Also, the Torah says, you are less than all the nations. It's a verse in the Torah. We should have been four billion people today. The Jews and the Chinese started in the same generation 4,200 years ago, after the flood of Noah. The Torah described in Parashat Noah the genealogy of Shem, Ham, and Yefet. Noah had three sons. Shem, it's our father, that's why when you hate a Jew, they call you anti-Shemi, anti-Semite. Shem, it's Sem in English. Someone who hates Jews, they call him anti-Semite. Why? Because he hates the race that came out of Shem, the son of Noah. Then you have Yefet, which is Yofi, beauty, that's Europe. And today Canada and America, that came out of Europe. So it's called Yefet. From the, world, from the word Yofi, beauty. They all got the look. And then you have Ham. Ham means hat. Where is it? All the Africans, which is mainly blacks. Nigeria, these, all these countries. Three sons scattered in the world in different continents. And the, who is the uncle of the Chinese? Shem. Shem, his nephew, sons, is China. Asini. So we, they, were, they lived in the same generation. The founder of Chinese people and the founder of Jewish people lived at the same generation. You have 2 billion Chinese, 1.5 billion on the paper, and 500 million Chinese with no documents. They don't have passports, no ID, nothing. They can't ever leave China. And nobody knows they exist. Because in China, you're only allowed to have one child legally. If you become pregnant again, either you have to abort or to hide for the rest of your life. Now I have to have a second baby, it's against the law, you can get arrested. So some of them run out of China and they give birth, some of them just hide the baby with no paper. It doesn't exist in the system. There's 500 million Chinese like this. So 2 billion Chinese, 15 million Jews. And they started in the same generation. So Chinese with restriction on birth are 2 billion. Jews that never had restriction on birth, they had 10, 12, 12, 15. Look at your grandmothers in Morocco. They all got married 12, 13. They had 10 kids, 12 kids. This was the Jewish nation in Europe and in the Arab countries for one to generations with no restriction. So we should have been 4 billion Jews. Where are they all gone? The answer, assimilation, and punishments. The Torah say that there are certain crimes and sins against God that cause death penalty, unfortunately. 36 of them is also a cut for the soul from the afterlife, such as breaking the Sabbath. Shabbat, it's not just a day of rest like some people think. <coughs> Even a king that lay in bed all day, all week, has to rest on Shabbat. It's nothing to do with physical rest, Shabbat. If you walk a waiter in a shul, and there's a Brit Milah of 500 people, and you walk like a dog, run, serve, clean, take out tables, take the garbage out, walk like a slave, you did not break Shabbat. You light one cigarette, you broke Shabbat. It's nothing to do with physical rest, like some secular people think. And it's nothing to do with the stupid claim that in the old days people need to rub two rocks to create a spark, and today we press a button and we have a fire. Stupid, stupid ignorance. There's nothing to do with the rocks. 
We're not uh, the ancient uh, Adam Akadmon. In the old days, everyone had candles in their walls. There was a hole in the wall, they put a barrel of olive oil, and they put some, uh, you know, uh, what's the name of it? A wick. 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 And they always have light in a house with candles. What happens if the light is about to go off? They take from here fire and they create. What do you think? They take two rocks now and try to create a spark. Moving fire, existing fire, from here to here, it's not allowed on Shabbat. Shabbat, you don't have a problem creating or working hard. You have a problem of creating Melechet Machshevet. You have a plan in your mind, what you want, and now you're creating it. You want light, you're creating light by closing the circuit. You have two pieces of material and you want to turn them into one, so you saw them. You have nothing written and you begin to write. Meaning, every form of creation is forbidden. Why? Because God wrote in the Torah, I created the world in six days, and the seventh day I rested. You are the children of God. I chose you from all the nations. In Mount Sinai, I gave you the Torah, and I did not give it to any other nation. I gave you the Torah in a public event in front of three and a half million witnesses. Nobody can deny it. That's why Christians and Muslims never even try to deny Judaism. It would be a lot easier to come, Muhammad, 2,000 years later, Forget about Jews! Forget about Judaism! That's all nonsense, fairy tales. Here, I am the real first prophet. Why Muhammad adopted Judaism? Why he called his children Ibrahim, Isa, Yaakub, Ismail, Ishmael, where all these names came from? The Torah. Why the Arabs don't eat pork? Because the Torah said not to eat pork. Why they don't collect interest from each other? It's in the Torah. Why the women dress mothers? It's in the Torah. Why they circumcise their baby? It's in the Torah. Everything they learn from the Torah. Nobody denies the Torah. All over the world I travel, every guy I spoke to admit that we are the chosen people and God gave us the Torah. Except Jews. <laughs> <laughs> They're all wise guys. <laughs> well, we live in you know, I have to hear the atheists that I debate with. Sometimes I think to myself, some people, it's very good for them to get educated. They become smarter. But some people, it's the exact opposite. The more academic they become, the more morons they become. <laughs> so stupid. How can you make such claims? Where is your common sense? I don't understand. A person that sells vegetables in the market who never went to school has more common sense than this professor. He comes and claims that the world was made from a random explosion. And there are students in university who goes like this. Wow, fascinating. Fascinating. It's, it's unbelievable. So, Abotai, I'm going to tell you now maybe things that you never heard before, but it's important to know for your life, for your future. The difference between Judaism and all other religions, every one of the religion, one individual came and claimed that God gave him something. But no one ever witnessed it. For instance, Muhammad. He came and he said that Angel Gabriel gave him the Quran. How many people witnessed it, Mr. Muhammad? No one, I was alone. Go and prove now. It's right away start with 50% doubt. It's his word against your word. Nobody witnessed that. Mary, Mary, Maria, Miriam, same lady. She gets engaged and gets married to Joseph the carpenter. Two Jews, Yosef and Miriam. They get married 2,000 years ago. In the old days, this is the way it was. You made chupa and kiddushin. You don't become intimate yet. You put the ring, you give the ketubah, and you go to work. Because everyone was learning in yeshiva, no one had money, so now they go and work for a few months. After a few months they come with some money, and they build themselves a nice cabin for wood. There was in the Beverly Hills mansion for 130 million. So they build everything, they put some tar, they put some candles in the wall, and you have a house. But you move in. Joseph the carpenter comes back after a few months, he sees his wife gain weight. But not from sushi. <laughs> What happened? Miriam. 
never touched you. Ah, you suspect me that I cheated? Yosef, what's wrong with you? And what, and so what happened? God came to me in a dream. He made me pregnant. Now remember, in the old days, if a married woman cheated on her husband and there was witnesses to the sin, it's a death penalty. He would lose her. If he turns her into the authorities, they will execute her. It's not like today she get a TV show <laughs> for being liberal. Today they'll give her a TV show. Oh, you're cheating on your husband? Wow, he's so wonderful. Come, let's give you a show. Maybe you teach the teenager's girl to follow you. Today it's a different world. But in the old days, do you know what a crime it was? A person would rather die than to cheat. Different world. So now he has one option, to turn her in or to play down. So he accepted her. And JC is born. And then they say that he went to yeshiva. Okay. How many people witnessed that God came to Mary in a dream and made her pregnant? Nobody. You cannot witness a dream. She make up a story. On top of it, the Christians say that the Torah is the book of God, and in the Torah, in the Torah it says that you're not allowed to go with a married woman. You're not allowed to make a married woman that belongs to another man, make her pregnant. The kid is illegitimate, mamzer. Why would God go to a married woman? There's plenty of singles. If he wants to bring the Messiah to a woman, he cannot find a single woman from all the women in the world. He has to find a married one. When he said that it's a death penalty, that's a good example for humanity to cheat. Stupid religion. Full of human errors. Watch my debate with a Christian professor. Three hours. 17 bottles of water he drank <laughs> in the debate. You have to see it. Millions saw it. He, 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 he almost killed himself from the shame. Why? It's not his fault. The religion is stupid. The religion is worse than five years old kids. You know, take a five years old kid from Yeshiva, pre-1A, tell him, make a fake religion. Write the book. He would do a better job. You cannot believe how many mistakes, human errors. But the Christians don't care about how authentic is the religion. They only care about the Christmas tree, and the lights, and Santa, and the gifts, and gathering together two, three times a year. That's it. What do I care? JC existed, huh? Christmas, not Christmas, who cares? We, we have something in life. Without it, we don't have anything. We want some spirituality. Okay. The Torah, unlike them, is a whole different story. The Torah started in a public event with three and a half million people. You can never fake such an event. The only religion in the world that started in a public event, that three and a half million people receiving the book of God from God, through Moshe, in a public event. In the Torah, you have 100 miracles that are described that happened to them until now. Each one of the miracles is against all odds. Each one of them. Manna is falling from heaven, the Red Sea split, he went through the Egyptian drowns, all kinds of things. But the highest level is when Moshe come to three and a half million people and give them the, to the first Torah in a live event. And they open up the Torah, and what does it say there? All of you heard and saw me speaking to God in front of your eyes. Now I want to ask you a question. If I'm a faker, and I wrote the Torah in my kitchen last night, why would I do such thing? Let's think. If a person pretends to be a prophet, he wants to be a leader, he wants to dominate the public, he wants to control, maybe he's a control freak, maybe he wants donations, money, maybe he thinks he's the smartest so he should be the leader, maybe he's just crazy, maybe he just wants to be memorized as some kind of a hero. It could be many reasons why a person will fake a religion. But tell me please, if I wrote the book last night in my kitchen and I came here to all of you tonight, and I say, ladies and gentlemen, I am your new prophet. Here is the book that God gave me. All of you must follow the instructions. And if you have questions, I'm your address. I'm the king over here. I'm the prophet. You open up the book 
And you see right there that all of you heard me speaking to God. Can I come and sell you such a fairy tale story that all of you heard me speaking to God if it never happened? Why would I do such a stupid thing? Immediately you begin to throw tomatoes in my face. Get out of here, you crook. None of us heard God. How do you claim that we heard you and God speaking? None of us was in Egypt. None of us saw the Red Sea split. None of us see everyday manna falling from heaven. None of us has all these things that it's written. Where did you make up all these stories from? If one of the hundred miracles that is listed in the Torah did not really happen, immediately they'll make riots and kill him. Especially when he, when he gave them the Torah, they just found out that thousands of them have to leave their wives and children. Why? Until the Torah was given, you're allowed to marry your aunt. Your father has a young sister, younger than you. You marry her, you have ten kids. Mr. Moshe Rabbeinu comes from the mountain, gives you the Torah, you open it up. Ervat dodatcha lo tegale, parashat acharemot. Do not touch your aunt, she's forbidden to you. Cannot have any intimacy with her. What do you mean? She's my wife, I have ten kids with her. We've been married for twenty years, Moshe! What did you do? What can I do? That's what God told me. I'm sorry. <coughs> and you want to hear the best part? Who is Moshe's father? Amram. Who is his mother? Yochevet. Yochevet is the end of Amram. He goes against his own parents. Would Moshe write in a book that he faked, that he's stuttering? And he has speech problem? Well, Moshe write in a book that he got punished and did not enter Israel and God got angry at him? Will Moshe write in a book that his two children were useless and they couldn't take his place and Yoshua had to take the place because his children were not capable? Will Moshe write all kinds of things against himself that will be memorized in history forever? Did you see one word against Muhammad in Islam? Try. Let's see where you're going to be tomorrow. Try to say one thing by hinting against Muhammad. That will be the end of you. Try to speak against JC in the church. Mm. In the end of him. The Torah is full of Lashon Ara, gossip, against King David, King Solomon, against King Hiskiyahu, against their children, against Moshe, against Yoshua, against everyone. Because the Torah is the only divine, authentic, objective, real, divine document in the history. Over there, God doesn't write lies. What happened? It happened. And it's written. It's not politics, it's not shoving under the rug. So there's no way to come to millions of people and convince them that they witness me speaking to God unless it really happened. That's the reason why three and a half million people became religious instantly. And all of them scream, Kol asher diber Hashem naaseh venishma. Everything God say, we will do, and then we will understand. No question asked. In case you didn't know, until 220 years, there was no secular people in the world. Did you know that? Every country you would go, ask where the Jews live, you would come to the community, everybody was fully religious. All women were dressed modest, all men would have yarmulke or turbans or hats. Europe, Arab countries, Morocco, everybody was religious. Until 220 years ago, one Orthodox rabbi in Germany, Moses Mendelssohn, decided to go to university. Until then, no Jews would dare to step in the university. They teach a lot of heresy there. Okay, it's against the Torah. Moses Mendelssohn said, I know Torah, I'm a rabbi. Let me hear what the Goyim wisdom has to say. He went to university, all his sons followed him. Within 10 years, they all married Christian German women and converted to Christianity. That was the end of his genealogy. And that was the beginning of the Ascala movement. The Jews saw that the rabbi went to university and they all started to follow. Within 150 years after Moses Mendelssohn, 80% of the Jews in Germany were married to non-Jewish women, which all their children are not Jewish. It was such massive assimilation. 
that God say one more generation and there's not going to be one Jew left in Europe. It will be the end of it. I never knew, I'm sure all of you heard about Kristallnacht, right? When I went to school, they told me that the Nazis, they burned 1,300 synagogues in one day. 1,300 synagogues, big, massive ones. Shocking, wow. I never knew that all those synagogues were all reformed. None of it was Orthodox. Until my friend Rabbi Ben Porat, the world expert in the Holocaust, he knows every detail. Every book that was ever written about the Holocaust, he can tell you everything. He's an expert. He's in his 70s, brilliant, genius man, Rosh Yeshiva in Yerushalayim. We do seminars together. He told me he didn't know that all these synagogues were all worse than churches. So, huh? What? Yeah, they were all reform. You didn't have anyone, no one was there, Shomer Shabbat. Everyone was married to Goyim. There's nothing Jewish there. I said, how come nobody knows about it? Ah, how come? The communists want you to know that? I said to him, now one? He said, yeah, there was no Orthodox Jews left in Germany. Everyone was Mechalel Shabbat. They changed the Sidur to Berlin. They erased Jerusalem, they wrote Berlin. They all took the Yamaka off, they all got rid of their beer, they all went to university, they all merry goyim, they all ate not kosher. This was right before the Holocaust. The Holocaust is a sensitive manner. Why? Because people react with emotions. They can't think straight. When the heart kicks in, the brain frees. Remember the rule, especially by women. Women, Hashem made them in such a way that they're all the time emotional. They're all the time sensitive. And who cries right away, a man or a woman? You tell a story in a lecture, all the, le the ladies like this. <laughs> and the men, barely <laughs> falling asleep. Why? All the women cry. Why? That's the way they are. They're sensitive. So, the Holocaust is a very sensitive man. Why? Because if you try to explain the Holocaust to people in a rational way, since they think with the heart, they get angry. Let's try not to get emotional and try to stick to the fact. In the Torah, the Holocaust is described. Did you know that? Exactly what happened in Europe is described in Parashat Vayelech word by word. Allow me to read it to you. In Parashat Vayelech, Hashem said to Moshe, one day after you pass, this nation will be so ungrateful to me and break the covenant that we made in Mount Sinai to such an extent that they will follow fake religions and fake gods and ignore me and complete, leave my religion completely. And at that time, I would leave them completely in the hand of a very cruel nation. A nation that have no mercy on women and children I will close my eye, aster astir panay mehem, and I would leave them in the hand of these monster goyim. I will not be there to defend them. Why? Because they said there is no God among, the, among us. So that's what's going to be. No God among you, there will not be God among you. And it describes exactly that the goyim will destroy us almost completely. So it's a few verses in Parashat Vayelech. Now you may come and say, Rabbi, who told you that God is really speaking about the Holocaust? Maybe speaking about the destruction of the first temple. Maybe speaking about the destruction of the second temple. Maybe he speaks about all kinds of pogroms that happen in Russia. How do you know that this half a page, that this half a page, how do you know that this half a page in Parashat Vayelech speaking about the Holocaust. <clears throat> now I'm going to shock you, but before I'm going to shock you, let me first explain to you about something that exists in the Torah. It's called Codes, Mathematical Skips in the Torah, in the text. Let me explain to you something. If I want to send a spy to Iran, I sit in Israel, I'm his handler, and I send him now to Tehran. 
He has to write to me emails every day about what he discovered in Iran. But you know, the Iranians are not stupid, they check emails. If, let's say, he found out that the Iranians have already three atomic bombs, how is he going to write it to me without the Iranian find out and come and kill him? So we agree on equal mathematical code. You're going to write to me any nonsense you want, just plan that every 50 letters in a story count. So from the first letter, I circle it, I count 49 letters, the 50th letter, I circle. I count 49 letters, the 100 letters, I circle. 150, 200, 250, 300. So when the, when the Iranians would read the email, I woke up in the morning, I ate bagel, I went back to sleep, I washed my face, I brushed my teeth. It looked like an ordinary email. When I get the email, I am the only one who knows what he really writes. What? He wants to say there are three nuclear bombs ready. There are. So the first letter will be T, 50 letters H, 50 letters E, 50 letters R, 50 letters E, 50 letters A, 50... You got the point? Okay. That's called equal mathematical scheme. The Torah has many thousands of equal mathematical schemes hidden in the text. We discover it when they discover and invented computers. Why? Because a man, there's billions of, of options. It will take you seven years to find one code. The computer searched the entire Torah in less than a second. So let me give you an example. You come to the Torah and you put the word Yitzhak Rabin. The Prime Minister of Israel that was murdered. The computer will search the word Yitzhak Rabin in equal mathematical scheme. Yitzhak, it's Yud. First letter Yud. He takes the Yud, he counts two letters. After two letters, if it's going to be Tzadik, he will continue with two letters, looking for Chet. If after two letters it's not Chet, he goes back to the Yud and try three. Three, three, three. No, he goes back to the beginning. Four, four, four. Five, five, five. Six, six, six. Until he will find Yitzhak Rabin in equal mathematical scheme. It could be 15, it could be 30, it could be 50. Equal between one letter to another. How many letters in between? Equal amount. We come to the computer, we put Yitzhak Rabin, the Torah search, and found that in one page in the Torah. We put the name of his murderer, Igal Amir. Igal Amir. Yud, Gimel, Aleph, Lamed, Ain, Mem, Yud, Resh. Eight letters. Igal Amir. The computer searched the entire Torah. What did he find? Igal Amir. In the same page where it's Rabin is. But wait. It's shocking. They have a mutual Resh. The Resh of Rabin and the Resh of Amir, they cross each other. Not only both people are appearing in the Torah in equal mathematical skip from 3,300 years ago, the Torah already shows you that there's going to be connection between two. Why? Because they have a mutual Resh. They cross each other. This is one out of many thousands of codes that were found in the Torah. We put the word AIDS. Aleph, Yud, Yud, Dalet, Samech. Aleph, Yud, Yud, Dalet, Samech. Five letters. It's only in Hebrew. The computer search for AIDS in the Torah. Where do you think the computer found AIDS in equal mathematical skip in the Torah? In Parashat Noach. What's described in that page? The scene of homosexuality. Right there. The word AIDS in equal mathematical skip. We put more than 20 names of Nazis in a computer. Rudolf Hess, Adolf Eichmann, Adolf Hitler, The Final Solution, Zyklon B, all the things that connect to the Holocaust, all of them in one page. We put all the names of all the fruits and all the vegetables. Chita, Seora, Rimon, Zait, anything you can think of. 
All of that appear in the first page of the Torah that speaks about God made garden in Eden and asked Adam to be in charge of the trees. All these equal mathematical words not only appear in equal skips in the Torah, which you can see a planner that knows the future, it always relates, relates to the content of the story. Shocking. In the part that describes the Holocaust, you have the word Hashoah. He, Shin, Vav, Aleph, He. He, 49 letters. Shin, 49 letters. Vav, 49 letters. Aleph, 49 letters. He. In half a page that describes that one day there's going to be a Holocaust because the Jews stop to keep Shabbat and stop to follow the Torah and stop dress mothers, and start becoming uh, like the Goim and marry the Goim, in that page that describes what's going to be our end, the word Hashoah is hidden in the text in equal mathematical skip. Can it be random? Absolutely not. I'll give you another example. The Torah warned the Jews not to follow fake religions. Interesting, the Torah he called the fake religion the religion of the wood and the religion of the rock, of the stone. Elohe etz va'even, God of wood and God of stone. When you read it, you think maybe someone made an idol from a stone or someone made an idol from a wood, so the Torah said do not bow down to the idol. But which two religions connects to the rock and to the stone, and to the wood? Christianity, knock on wood, J.C. hanged on a, on a cross. And Muslim in Mecca, they have this big rock. They all go to Mecca in the Ramadan. Now, two million girls, they wear white kilts like this. You say, Rabbi, you have great imagination. You like to find things and make it already as a fact. How do you know the Torah talks about Christianity in Islam? Just because it mentioned the wood and the rock? Yeah, you're right, it's not a proof. But here comes the proof. You ready? In the only sentence in the Torah that God warned the Jews do not follow the religion of the wood and the religion of the rock, do you know which two words appear in that verse in equal mathematical skip? Yeshu, and Mecca. Yud, 50 letters. Shin, 50 letters. Vav, Mem, 50 letters. Chaf, 50 letters. Hey. Yeshu, JC. Right? And Mecca, the city of, the, of Islam. They both appear in the only verse that want the Jews not to follow fake religion, the religion of the wood and the religion of the stone. In this text, God put Yeshu and Mecca. I want to remind you, Judaism is 1,300 years before Christianity and 2,000 years before Islam. So the writer of the Torah not only has unbelievable ability in math and statistics, he knows all the future, and he was able to put in a Torah information that will be relevant 2,000 years later in details in the right places. I just gave you four or five examples. You can count on me that I have more than a thousand like this to show you. More than a thousand. But I don't want to keep you here until the morning, so, and I also want to give you time for questions. So let's just get the idea here. The only book in the whole world that can be proven beyond any doubt, not beyond reasonable doubt, beyond any doubt, the only book that is 100% divine, every letter of it there. If you take one letter out of the Torah, you mess it all up. You mess all the codes, you miss everything. If you take one letter out of the Torah, you can take the Torah and throw it in the luggage. It's not holy anymore. Divine is 100% divine. You take one letter out of 304,805 letters, one letter out, yud, tiny yud, you take out. Some words in Hebrew, if you take the Yud out, it doesn't change the meaning. It doesn't change. Everybody will know what it means. Take one Yud out, the Torah is not kosher. You want a mail, you want to ship it, put it in a box, UPS. Deliver it. No problem. If all the letters are there and the Torah fell on the floor, everybody has to fast, to cry, it's a big thing. 
take one yud out, you can throw the Torah yourself to the luggage. No problem. Why? Zero holiness. One person told me, don't you think it's an extreme? Ma, still we know the story of God, still there's verses over there. What do you mean no holiness? I think it's too much. So I say to him, okay, I'm going to send you a proof. What's your email? He gave me some email. I said to him, okay, I'm sending it to you. You got it? No. Okay, let me send it again. I send it again. You got it? No. This, what is it? I love life dot, uh, at gmail.com. I love life at gmail.com. You got it? No. What? Four times. Check your computer. I'm getting other emails. I love life at gmail com. right? No, what about the dot? I said, no, I didn't write the dot. Yeah, I have to put dot com. Big deal. What's the dot? <laughs> What's big deal? Why, how did that change anything? Without the dad, there's nothing. Just doesn't go through. You lose all the holiness. So, Abotai, it's a great honor to be a Jew. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It. Everybody in the world admires the Jews. As much as they hate us, they know we run the show. We always been and we will always do because the whole world is a covenant between God and His chosen people. I want to read to you a few verses from the Torah that you probably never heard before. Maybe if you heard it, you'll be dancing on the street of Montreal. <laughs> Let me give you a few, few of them to be proud of. I want you all to be holy because I'm holy. I made a covenant with your righteous fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I promise them that I will never replace their children with any other nation. I will bring you to the promised land. I'll give you the holy land. And you will, be, you will build the temple for me and I will live among you. Do not imitate the goyim that I threw out of Israel and gave you the land. Because all the despicable things that they did got me to get sick and tired of them. A kutzba. I'm done with them. I'm giving you now the land, but you should know that the land is not given to you permanently because I am the owner of the land. If you follow my instructions, you'll be able to live in the land. And if not, the land will vomit you to exile. I will send you a nation from far that you won't recognize their language. It's talking about the Romans. Their sign will be eagles eagle on their helmet. They will have no mercy on women and children. They will come and destroy the temple and they will sell you to Egypt to be slaves and they will ship you there by boats. This is an unbelievable prophecy. It's against all logic to sell a million slaves to Egypt. All you have to do is to let them walk three days. You have to bring from Italy boats and ship them to Egypt or you're out of your mind. Let them walk. But the Torah also said that in Egypt, the price of a Jewish slave will be less than the meal of a horse, meaning less than $10. Unbelievable things that all of them happen in details. Then the Torah continue. I chose you from all the nations to be mine. I chose you from all the nations to be mine. You represent me in the world. I kept the Sabbath six days. I created the world, and in a six day, in a seven day, I rested. I want you to be exactly like me. Sanctify the Shabbat because it's an eternal covenant between me and you for eternity. And this is what we say in a Kiddush. We read a part from the Torah. Here, I'll translate it to you. V'shamru b'nei Yisrael et ha-Shabbat. And the nation of Israel observed the Sabbath. La'asot et ha-Shabbat ledorotam brit olam. To do the Sabbath for their generations an eternal covenant. Brit olam, eternal. Be'ni uven b'nei Yisrael oti le'olam. Between me and the nation of Israel, it's an eternal agreement. Beni uven Israel, oti leolam, ki sheshet yamim asa Hashem et ha-shamayim et ha-aretz, 
וביום השבירי שבת ויהי נפש. God made the world in six days and in the seven day he rested. מחלליה, someone who makes Shabbat a weekday. Everything is usual, working, driving, smoking, watching, riding, as usual. מחלליה, what's מחלל? חול, חול it's weekdays. Someone who Shabbat for him is a regular day. מחלליה, מות, יומת, duplication. will die younger in this life, supposed to live to 80, will die 70, supposed to live to 90, will die younger. But that's not the punishment. <coughs> Mot, you mat. After he die, he will die second time. The Torah explained from eternal life. Mot, you mat. The Ramban, Maimonides, he writes, Mot ba'olam hazeh, you mat ba'olam haba. Ve'nikreta הנפש ההיא מהמאה. I will cut that soul out of the Jewish nation for eternity. Scary, shocking. I have to be... I don't know what to say. I don't want to say fool. I don't want to say stupid. I don't, I don't want to say out of rock. I don't know how to define someone that reads such a thing in a divine book 12 times. That the creator of the world that gives you oxygen and everything you have is in his hand. Everything. And he writes, if you will keep my Shabbat, my covenant, you belong to my nation, and you are my son, and you are holy, and you represent me to the world, and when you die, I will send you to a world which is eternally, eternity of pleasure to the soul. And if not, you would lose that eternal life for breaking the covenant. How can we as people ignore such an instruction? So I want to tell you, most Jews in the world have no idea whatsoever what Shabbat is. That's why they take it lightly. I, Baruch Hashem, God gave me the talent or the, I don't know how to call it. I speak for 27 years and I can promise you that I made more than 150,000 Jews fully religious. Thousands of them learned in yeshivot, more than about 1,200 Kohen that became Jewish. I have, uh, everywhere in the world I go, I see my Baalei Tshuva, Baruch Hashim. I just made a film about Shabbat 35 days ago in Hebrew. In 35 days we have 450,000 views. One hour film with all the sources about Shabbat. You have to read the comments of the people. Complete atheists, they claim they're atheists. Professors, doctors, lefties, even Goyim, even Arabs, even Druzim. Russian goyim, Ukrainian, Israel is full of goyim. They write, I'm shocked. I had no idea what Shabbat is. Most Jews break Shabbat not because they're evil people. Not because they want to say to God, you give me and I don't give anything about you. No. It's just that they don't think what they do. They don't think. Just like in medicine, how many mistakes we do with the way we eat and with the, with the things that we do, we destroy our life. It all comes from ignorance. You don't know computers, you make mistakes that cost a lot of money. You don't know accounting, you make mistakes that cost a lot of money. I'll give you one example from today. One guy from Israel told me, and I'm going to believe what I just found out. I moved from America to Israel, and I have investments in America, you know, all kinds of IRA and this, and there is a mistake in the IRS laws that they wanted to write that there is no double tax. You either pay in America taxes or in Israel, but not in both. By mistake they wrote, you don't pay if you have dual citizenship and you move from America to Israel, there's an agreement, you don't have to pay tax at all in either country. It's a mistake. The only accountant that found it is the accountant of this guy which it happened to be my bad shoe. He said, I can't believe it. it's too good to be true. Save me tens of thousands of dollars in taxes now. Should I do it? I said, what, are you normal? What do you ask? Of course you should do it. <laughs> Tomorrow they'll change the law. So the idea is, Rabotai, ignorance is the biggest enemy of the human being in everything. Whatever you do in life, you're, you're an architect and you didn't learn all the laws, the building will collapse. You're doctors, but you didn't learn 100% what can happen to the heart if the person has high sugar or blood pressure. One class you didn't show up. That's it. It's going to die until you want a surgery. 
anything you are, if you didn't learn one detail that it's crucial, you can destroy it. Needless to say, the most important thing that you don't learn what's your purpose in life and why God put you over here and he put you here in the test for 78 years and you're not even aware of it. You never read the verse in the Torah, there's an eye who watch you. There is a ear who listens to you. And everything you do is written in the book of God. It's a verse in the divine book. I'm recording you. Everything you did in your life, you will stand in front of me when you die and you will be judged for good or for bad. You give charity, very good. You stole, very bad. You were faithful, very good. You cheated, very bad. You, you kept Shabbat, fantastic. You did it, horrible. You dressed not modest as a woman in the street. So many people looked at you, had bad thoughts. It's not modest. It's not dignity of a married woman. Very bad. You dress classy like Queen Elizabeth. She's not Jewish, by the way. Did you ever see her wear something that is not halachically correct? She's more a rabbit than the other abanyot I know. And she has a, I think she has a, how much, how much was her diamond? 15 million dollar diamonds on a crown, some number. So she is the queen, already almost 100 years old, and since I remember her, at least 40 years, she never once wore a mini skirt or pants or short sleeve or sleeveless shirt. Why? Because the queen understand I'm a classy lady. Classy lady don't dress half naked. One time I was in Miami, I was a Moroccan angry guy. <laughs> <laughs> ah, come on, this once in a while happened. <laughs> so there was one angry Moroccan guy and his lovely wife <laughs> treating the neighbors, I mean the guests. And I say to him, I don't understand. You let your wife go down to the beach and be with bikini in front of 10,000 men that I walks around and look at her? He said to me, what, what do you want? Everybody does it. I say, what? If everyone will take drugs, that means you have to take drugs. If everyone will jump from the window, you're going to jump, jump from the window. What does it mean everybody does it? And most of the world smoke. Is it good to smoke? Most of the world are liars. Is it good to lie? Most of the people are lazy. Is it good to be lazy? You be the winner. Don't be the loser like them. The conversation go on and I say to him, I, I, I would die if my wife would lay on the beach naked and 10,000 Spanish and Puerto Ricans and Cubans and Arabs would come and fantasize about her. If I would read their mind, I'll kill myself and them with me. He say to me, ah, but, but that's the way everyone is. What, what, what? I said to him, let me ask you a question. You know, your wife got so many guests here tonight in your beautiful house. Imagine now she comes from the bedroom with a bikini and high heels with a cake. Happy birthday to Moshe with her bathing suit. She came like this in front of three of your father, your brother, your boss, your, your children, everyone like this with a bikini and serve you with a happy birthday cake. What would you do? You know, by now the Moroccans had sparks coming out of it. <laughs> he said, I grab it, much like this, I grab it with the cake <laughs> and fly her out of the window. I say, why? She's going to do such a thing in my house. I say, you fool. Well, she's going to be naked here, I have no problem. But she's going to be naked here, fine. Why? Because you don't use your head. Wow, when you describe it like this, it's really disturbing. <coughs> Bottom line, whenever you read something in the Torah that you disagree with, you have to know that God knows better than you what's good for you. That's the beginning point. He made you. Who knows better, you or Him? He reads your mind. He knows your future. He knows what's the end of your path. He knows everything. He controls everything and he operates with you based on your free will. Because the Torah says, I'm giving you today the good and the bad, the, 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 the good and the bad, the life, the, the, the life and the good, the death and the bad. And you should choose the good, meaning you can choose the bad. Now I want to ask you a question. The Torah says that someone that breaks Shabbat, chas v'shalom, God forbid, 
will lose his life here and lose his life in the eternal world. The and, and the soul is being cut, it's a verse. The question is, we see 80% of the Jewish nation today drive on Shabbat. It's reality. Let's not try to make things nicer than they are. Most Jews don't keep Shabbat. Smoke, cigarettes, television, everything. How many of them die? Not even 1%. The rest make millions, successful, go on a boat, enjoy, live a nice life, have wife, children, business, millions, build <coughs> things. Look, enjoying the jet ski on Shabbat. Maybe the Torah after all is fairy tale. What do you think? <coughs> then we see a lot of wicked people enjoy life, and we see a lot of great Talmidei Chachamim, Bachurei Shiva. This guy died in a terror attack, 35 years old. Another one, 29 years old, but they kept Shabbat and they learned Torah. So where is the justice? What's written in the Torah and what's reality is complete opposite. Good question, no? So, I'm sure you're asking this question every day, that's why I brought it up. And after that, we'll give some time for questions. The point is, imagine life that God said to the Jewish people, once he gave them the Torah, do not create fire on Shabbat. Do not do this, do not do that, be careful here, be careful there. A person say, I don't care, I want a cigarette. He lights a cigarette, <laughs> explode. Thousand pieces he became. Like the Torah said, Chalet Shabbat, what you want? He died on the spot. Next Shabbat, another person wanted a cigarette, forgot about that guy. Lit a cigarette, <laughs> explosion. After that, anyone in the history of the world would ever dare to light a cigarette on Shabbat? No one. Not Jews and not Goyim even. Even Arafat, his wife say, Yes, sir, when in town? Shh, Shabbat, don't move. What do you hear? Not a Jew. Shh, I don't take risks. Few Jews lit cigarette, boom, they exploded right away. I don't want to move. They all sh talk to me Saturday night. If every person that would give a lot of tzedakah a minute after he writes the check to the rabbi, a second later, he won the lottery. He writes another, another big tzedakah, boom, they just got a call, you got the deal. He is unemployed, he just gave a hundred bucks to a poor guy at the door, he got a phone call, you hired. What do you think would happen in the world? I'll tell you how the world would be. No one would walk. Everyone will stay by the window of my yeshiva or other yeshivot. Rabbi, catch! What's that? 10,000! Catch! I, I called. As soon as he throw me 10,000, he just made 20,000. Because the Torah says, someone who gives a lot of charity, I'll make him rich. So if the response of God will be instant, every time you break the rule, boom, a punch to the face or a gun to the head. And every time you do something good, you win something big. From the minute the Torah was given, after a day or two, everyone would get the point. No one will ever commit a sin. No one. That's no test here. Because if you break Shabbat, you get a gun right away, blow your head off. Who's going to break Shabbat? The brilliance of God, and believe me, He knows everything. The more you learn, the more you understand the system. He said to you, don't break Shabbat. And you open your business on Shabbat, and most of your business is on Shabbat. You have a restaurant, Monday, slow. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, ah. Shabbat, Shh. business is booming. People have off. Rabbi, you want me to close the restaurant on Shabbat? You crazy? What I do on Shabbat, I don't make in six days. I want to ask you a question. If Shabbat would be the slowest day of the week, what test people would have? Anyway, it's bad day. Close. It's always the busiest day of the week. Do you trust me that I feed you or you think the restaurant feed you? <laughs> Many educated people, they invested a lot of their lives in universities and they became lawyers and doctors and judges and a lot of important people. And always in their mind they think, I made myself. Without me learning and going and trying and fighting and learning again and promoting, and I will never become who I am. But that's all an illusion. <clears throat> In Rosh Hashanah, Hashem writes how much money you make. 
whether you're the greatest doctor in the world or you're the dumbest person in the world. You can be Tyson, make 30 million, you can be the greatest doctor in the world and make only one million. Everybody understand that you're a million times better than this low life. But this is what God wanted. Bin Laden had billions. Rav Ovadi Yosef didn't have billions. Rav Rachaim Kanievsky didn't even have millions. Haman was the richest man in the world, and the Torah told you how much God hates him. There's a lot of billionaires in the world that they are the filthiest people in the world, and the Torah, according to the Torah, they have the worst hell when they die. Now you wonder, so what's going on here? There's no mystery at all. It's just lack of education. The Torah in the end of Parashat Vaitchanan. First the Torah say, everything you have, I gave you. I filled your home that you did not feel. I built your homes that you did not build, even though you think you designed it, you bought, you bought the lot, it was a great deal, everything I do for you. I gave you everything you have, I gave you your food, I gave you gold, and I gave you silver, and I gave you success. Be careful never to dare and say, to think that thanks to your brilliance, or thanks to your talent, you became wealthy. It's a very big, big mistake. Because in the end, you're only successful because I wanted you to be successful. Because I decided when you came to the world that you will be rich, and I decided that your brother that is 10 times smarter than you will be poor. Now, how is it possible that the most wicked people, they're very, very powerful? Look at the world, look at Sleepy Joe, look at all these politicians. They're all making fortune, and look what's going on. So the answer is, it's written in the end of Parashat Vaitchanan. It's written in the end of Parashat Vaitchanan. I'm going to read it to you, three verses. I am the faithful God. Give my lovers that keep my commandments, pay my lovers that keep my commandments for thousand generations. We only live one generation. Where is the meaning after? And pay my haters instantly to their face to get rid of them. I will not delay the reward of the wicked people. I will give them immediately to their face to get rid of them. Translation. And then we'll start the question. Translation. Those who are righteous, they have an eternal world to come. When the body, when the soul leaves the body, the body goes to the ground, and it's written in the book of Kohelet that the soul goes up, back to God that gave the soul into the body. When the Torah says, sometimes I'm strict with you and I'm torturing you to check what's in your heart. Will you be faithful and keep my commandments or not? To reward you in your end. What does it mean to reward you in your end? I never saw anyone who goes to the grave that gets any reward. If any, the snakes and the worms eat him up. And when people get old, they don't get any reward. Their knees hurts. They lose their memory, they lose their hair, they lose their eyes, they lose everything. And they can wake up and they suffer, and who knows what, the old people have a lot of problems. Where is the old people got the reward that the Torah promised? What do you think, God is a member in Congress? Or in a Canadian government? No. When he said, I'm, I'm going to reward the righteous, for sure it will happen. And he also said, when? I will reward you in your end. Meaning when you die, the reward will begin. What about the wicked people? Why do you have to reward them in, in general? They are wicked. Every wicked person does some good deeds. Every, almost every Jew has a mezuzah, even if he doesn't keep anything else. Almost every Jew circumcises sons, even if he's an atheist, claiming. But he did Brit Milah. Well, a few times in his life he made a bracha or say amen or I don't know, put filin in his bar mitzvah for the pictures. So he has few mitzvot here and there. Right or wrong? Take the most secular person in the world, I can show you at least a thousand mitzvot he kept in his life. Even Tommy Lapid, the father of Yair Lapid, 
the number one wicked person in Israel, made a circumcision to Yair Lapid. And if you would hear interviews with him, he would literally curse God in a live interview. Curse, curse. And he made Brit Mila. Once I wrote him a letter, you're the biggest hypocrite in politics. <laughs> What's the, I say, if there was justice in the country, you would be put in prison for 20 years. Who gave you permission to cut a part from your eight days old baby, a part of his body, out of nowhere? Based on what? If you would cut his ear, you would go to prison for 20 years. No, but nobody touched you because you circumcised him. But you said that the Torah is nothing. So if the Torah is not from God, we're back to square one. You cut a part from his body. He should be in prison for 20 years. Why did he answer me? He cared about me. He never answered. But the point, that even people that curse God, God forbid, or do the worst thing you can imagine, they still have some good things they do. When will God give them the reward? They have no share to the world to come. They lost it. That's, that's it. So he has to pay them in this life. So he gives them wealth and children and wife and beauty and success and power and control. Why? Because I must pay them in this world. It's a clear three verses in the Torah. It's not my opinion. I pay the righteous for thousands, thousand generations, but I pay the wicked immediately to their face to get rid of them. I will not delay the reward like I do with the righteous. It's verses in the Torah, not rabbis, not uh, in the Torah, fire book of Moses. End of Parashat Vaitchana, that's it. So now when you see a wicked person succeed, is the most miserable one. Not only you should be jealous with him, you should feel very bad for him. Knowing what God wrote in the book, you know where he's heading. When you see a righteous person suffer, feel very good for him. Don't follow your heart, follow your brain. That means before he dies, God cleans him. Sometimes short life is not a punishment. You finish your tikkun, you go to, you go to heaven. Who wants to be here? Once you be in heaven, you think you're going to miss Toronto or Montreal? <laughs> Come on. We think that dying is bad. Not necessarily. Depends if you go to heaven or hell. Or you come back in reincarnation in all kinds of other things. There's, it could be person can come back in animals, in raw material, in plants, in Down syndrome children, in all kinds of forms. So the, all, the point is Rabotai, most Jews do not keep the religion, not because they're evil, not because they are ungrateful, because they have zero knowledge in Judaism. Just like I would not criticize Shakespeare because I never read his books, I'm not going to stand in front of all the experts that know Shakespeare by heart and criticize him and destroy his image, and then they'll ask me, excuse me, where are you from? Where, do you, where is your education? Which books of Shakespeare you are talking about? I have no idea. How many books he has? Did you ever read his book? No. How do you stand here for an hour and destroy the book of Shakespeare and criticize it and make him look like a loser when not once in your life you even read what he has to say? First read it and then criticize. All the Jews in the world criticize the Torah, almost all of them, non-stop. And now one of them read the Torah from the beginning to the end even once. <coughs> Forget about the whole Torah. One chapter they never read. One page they never read. Now one verse they know how to explain. From thousands of us. I know, I'm in, I'm in the business. I have in Israel professors, doctors, you know, my lectures in Israel is hundreds of people. It's not... So they come and they argue. Ah, they... I said to him, excuse me, you ever read the Torah once in your life? Be honest. Yeah, I read it. So why do you open your mouth? I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to go in front of 5,000 doctors and make myself look like a fool and argue with them how to operate. <laughs> Even if they say weird things, I will assume that they know what they're talking about. And I, I am the loser here. I never learned. Same thing in anything else. Why you open your mouth in my territory? <clears throat> You have knowledge, come and argue. He continued to argue. So I said to him, I can prove to you now you don't know how to read Hebrew. 
מה? אני דוקטור! אלף תואר שני, עדיף! You know, who I heard his ego. I say, you're gonna regret it. I will bring you up to the stage and show everyone you don't know how to read one word in Hebrew. מה? Bring the Rambam. Bring, come, come here. Read. Promise you, every other word in the mystic. He doesn't know how to read. Get, get out of here. Next time, don't ever open your mouth. You first you learn how to read Hebrew. Then you read the Torah once in your life. After you understand the literal meaning of the words, come back to me, because there is a million other things to learn. I'm not asking you Kabbalah and secrets and Midrashim and Gemara and Zohar. Forget about this. Just the meaning of the words, like they teach in first and second grade to our children. After you know, you will not argue with me anymore. I won't have to convince you that the Torah is divine. Just reading 10 pages in the Torah about the sacrifices. Do you know how strange the laws are? There's not one human being in the whole universe that will ever make up such a strange laws. Slaughter the animal like this, take a few drops of blood, splash it in the corner of the altar, take a little bit, put in the ear of the, of the, of the Kohen, put some on his toe. What is this? <laughs> take the kidney and take the liver. Ah, what human being will make such laws? First of all, it costs millions of dollars, all this slaughtering of sheep. Every time you have to bring a sacrifice, it's 300 bucks. Plus, there was no cars. You have to go from Tiberias to Jerusalem. It's two weeks on the road with the donkey. <laughs> two weeks to get to Jerusalem, two weeks to come back. You're out of business. <laughs> what human being will make such a strange laws? The more you learn, the more you understand how much in the darkness and how much in the light you live. That's why Hashem loves you very much and He brought you all of you here tonight. For those of you who knows me, they know where, you know, the future is heading. For those who just met me, I don't ask for that much from you. Just continue to hear more lectures. Educate yourself about marriage, raising children, about depression, about success, about honesty, pride, ego, anger, laziness. I don't think there's one topic in life that I, that I don't have a lecture about. Thousands of lectures. The more you listen, the more you will learn what's right and wrong in the eyes of your Creator. If you get educated in Torah, there is a chance you'll be righteous and succeed and get your ticket to the, the share to the world to come. If you will not educate yourself, you will never make it there. And I'm Haaretz Hasim. I'm never going to be a doctor if I don't go to medical school. There's no chance. I will not be a lawyer if I don't go to law school. You will not be righteous if you not know the Torah and you don't learn what the Torah says. You'll never be righteous. Because you're going to follow your emotions. Your emotions sometimes are the exact opposite of what God said. God, for instance, said to execute murderers, not to give them a plasma TV and play shesh and eat pastrami every day, like the Arabs in Israel. What reason they have not to kill us? They leave 17 people in a little room in Gaza. They can't blow up the head of few Israelis, they get upgraded. <laughs> they get a sweet in a jail, they all have cellular phones, and you're laughing. They even send Israeli girls to their rooms. The commander said to her, go to Ahmed. And Ahmed does what he does to her. They just came out on the news. You have to see their tables. I promise you, as fancy as your Shabbat meal, it doesn't come near what they eat every day. They watch sport, they have cell phone, and they go on a computer and they get a degree. And we have to pay, and the Israeli government paid them 2,000 shekel a month for each prisoner from our taxes. And Bachur that learns in yeshiva, they, they give him 270 shekel, which is $90 a month, and drink his blood, putting him down day and night, you parasite. Go to work, who needs your Torah? 90 bucks, 700 bucks. 
to the murderers of our children, they pay. They didn't want to give one billion shekel to all the religious people in Israel. They did not want. You have to see what racism against the Torah. You know how much Hashem made them give to the Arabs? Hmm. 53 and a half billion shekel to the Muslim brothers to form a government. One billion to the yeshivot, they didn't want to give. Hashem said, no problem. The Torah revives you. The Torah protects you. The Torah keeps you in the Holy Land. You don't want to evaluate the Torah. You're going to give to the Arabs who come to kill your children. Why? Measure for measure. When you begin to appreciate my Torah, you will run to support the Torah, if you're smart. You're doing anyone a favor? <laughs> the Bachur Yeshiva that received money for you to learn all man Torah, he fill up your bank account with millions of mitzvot. It's a partnership deal. <clears throat> if I don't know anything about stock and I have an expert, if I give him $10,000 and he double it for me every month, <clears throat> who has to say thank you to who? I have to say to him or he has to say to me that I gave him the money. I have to beg him to take my money. He creates for me profit. But in this world, everything is the opposite. Any questions before we finish? Yeah. Yes, I want to hear. Mm -hmm. Yes. I know. I'm going to make some questions from what I heard. First of all, explain. I want to understand how someone is going to wake up in the morning and spend... I think that the prayer of the morning is 20 minutes, good 20 minutes? For women. No, for men. For I men, the plan, it goes to show or no? No, no, at the house, take out the book, put the tefillin. Minimum 20 minutes. Okay. Okay. So the man is going to wake up every morning, make his tefillin, put it in the right order, in the right spot. Yeah. At Shabbat. <coughs> ah, how is that possible? Shabbat is hard for him? They don't do Shabbat, but they, they do the prayers. They, they put that time every morning to them. They don't need the house before they, they do their prayers. I wish all the men was like that. Most men don't put feeling. Oh, but... Those who put feeling is very nice. Yes. All people do good and bad things, even very religious people. But how do you convince So they do good thing by putting feeling. They do a bad thing by breaking Shabbat. The problem is that breaking Shabbat makes them lose the Olam Abba. That's the <laughs> their next so, one. Okay, so I, I have a question. Yes. <laughs> so when my, when, my, when my daughter comes with 90% uh, and math, I'm very happy. I said, very good. When her teacher gives her 60%, okay, you pass. But Shabbat, is it 100%? So what is 100%? If I sleep all day, I don't create anything. Yeah. I rest. Yes. I still didn't go to the synagogue once, yes. twice, three times. Yes. I still didn't do this prayer, this prayer, this. So where does it... Very where, good question. What is Shabbat? Very good question. I say to some people, sleep the entire Shabbat. You say, what? I don't have to go to shul? You have to, but if you can, don't go. I don't have to do kiddush? You have to, but if you can, don't do. Why I tell them to sleep? Because they're heavy smokers. And it's hard for them to be awake and not to smoke. So I say, you know what? Stay fight the night very late. I don't know, go to sleep 1, 2 a.m. and sleep until Saturday, Motsi Shabbos. And I say, it's good. I say, you didn't break Shabbat. You did not create fire, you did not light. You did not break Shabbat. So you're not falling in the category of execution on losing the shelter of the world to come. Now, of course, if a person like this comes to Shamaim, Hashem will tell him, shame on you, you couldn't do Kiddush, you couldn't go to synagogue, you couldn't hear the Torah. Yes, but like you say, he passed already. Now, it's like you said to your daughter, ah, come on, why are you bringing me 60? You can have done at least 90. <laughs> okay, but at least it's 60, she passed. She move on. She doesn't fail and go back another year in reverse. So, you're right. You, you brought a very good point. If, for instance, it's hard for a person to keep whatever we keep, and he thinks if he sleeps the entire Shabbat, he's not at least going to break it, let it be. It's a good start. Maybe after a while, you will begin to feel some conscious guilt. And I, I tell you, you want to hear how I started to keep Shabbat? My cousin, he told me, what's hard for you? I say to him, you know, I watch NBA games, there's the finals now, the playoff, and I, I listen to rock and roll music, and every Shabbat we drive all our friends to the beach in New York, in a, in a private beach. 
So, look what a clever man. He knew if he's going to tell me you're not allowed this, you're not allowed this, you're not even allowed to go to the beach. You're crazy, you're going to the beach with all the women there. But he was clever, because he knew once he gets me to stop breaking Shabbat, everything will follow. So he said to me, okay, in America you have two days off. So you can always go Sunday. It doesn't have to be Shabbat. Okay, no. What else is difficult? The games. It's on Shabbat afternoon. So leave the TV before Shabbat on. Don't touch it. Hide the remote. Watch basketball the whole Shabbat. Don't touch electric. Don't create fire. Don't go into cars. Can you live with that? I say yes. What else is difficult? I love the music. I can't stop. Make, put music in one of the room. Whenever you need music, go in the room, listen to the music. Is that kosher? Of course not. <laughs> but it's like a doctor that wants his patient to start change his diet. He's not going to give him the whole nine yards. He begins with what's most critical. First, get him to stop to break Shabbat. So now, after three or four weeks, I never forget that. I'm with a cup of Kiddush, 12 in the noon on Shabbat. <coughs> and I say, Peshamut is at the Shabbat, and I hear this guy on the TV, hey, he hit the free! <laughs> I said, it's such a shame, look at me. That's Shabbat? The next Shabbat, I said, forget about it. In the beginning, he asked me, what else is difficult for you? I said, I live in Manhattan, in the 19th floor, by the water. How am I gonna go 19 flights up? Especially August, humidity of New York. He said, stand by the elevator, wait for one of the going to go. Whatever floors they go, when they come out, you come out and continue by foot. After a month, one of the religious people in the neighborhood said, what, you're taking the elevator of Shabbat? I said, the Goy, the Goy is pressing the button. It's not honoring Shabbat. Within a few months, you become almost perfect. The most important thing is not to break Shabbat, because that's a death penalty and a cut for the soul. If you don't break Shabbat, you learn to evaluate Shabbat and to build it up. By the way, it's fantastic. You come to shul, you meet your friends, your family, you dress nice. Every Shabbat, it's like a week, it's a holiday. It's like Pesach. You come home with delicious food, you invite guests, they stay over, you play, you learn together. It's beautiful, man. It's heaven in this world. Ask any one of my Baalei Tshuva if he wants to go back to the days it was Mechalel Shabbat. Now one will say yes. Promise you. It just look bad because you have to have a test. Once you start, you're gonna see it's not so difficult. It's really not. More questions. Yeah. I have a question. I I did Shabbat and stopped doing it for the past thirty years, on and off, on and off. I heard that the worst thing is let's say you're a smoker, okay? You smoke on Shabbat. The, the worst thing is not to have the fear of God. For a, a Jewish guy to go outside and smoke on a busy street and a lot of Jews are passing by and they see him smoke, is, is actually better if it was that same Jewish guy who would hide on Shabbat to smoke just to know that another Jew will see him. So That's two different scenes. One is breaking Shabbat, it's between men to God, and when people see that a Jew commit a horrible sin in public, it's a different sin, it's called Chilul Hashem. It's a disgrace to the religion that someone that is a Jew steals in public, or they put him on TV robbing people, you know what I mean? That's called Chilul Hashem. It makes the religion bad in the eyes of the Goyim or the eyes of the secular Jews because they think if the Torah is so holy and these Jews are the chosen people and they learn Torah, how can they be so filthy? How can they do this and how can they do that and how can they steal and how can, you understand? So that's called Chilul Hashem. That's why it's better that he does it when no one sees, at least it doesn't bring shame. But it's still 100% a terrible scene between men to God. <laughs> But the person who does something he's not supposed to, but still has the fear, is it still as... If a person commits a sin and he's ashamed or he's afraid, obviously he has less punishment than someone who don't even care. Doesn't bother him. In my lectures, in Israel especially, sometimes people get angry. They get up, 
throw the chairs in front of everyone. It doesn't happen in Canada. <laughs> not, even in, not even in New York. But in Israel, you have people who have blood. When I speak about Michalel Shabbat, and I say, for instance, one of the things that get people crazy is only when I say what the Torah says. It's not, it's not my words. They get angry at me, obviously. What, are they going to start fighting with God? It's easier to take me as a scapegoat. So I say, you know that the punishment that God gives Michalel Shabbat is even bigger than the punishment he gives murderers? What? So yes, read in the Torah. A murderer has smaller punishment than a Michalel Shabbat. So some Michalalei Shabbat, they get up, ah, oh, it's crazy, they throw the chair and they leave. And everyone feel awkward, you know. Rabbi, I'm sorry, you know, he's an angry guy. I say, is the success of the night, this guy. So why? Why did he get up and leave and curse and throw the chair? Because he's dying from inside. It burns him. He just found out what I just said. It hurts him so much. He doesn't know what to do, so he, he, he acts crazy. All of you, <laughs> eating sleep, drinking wine. Wow, Mechanel Shabbat is worse than the man. Wow. And go into the car and stop the car. At least this guy is angry. That means he's going to make an impact on him. I was in the Beverly Hills once in a Persian shul. <laughs> you have to hear this. The rabbi told me, which minyan you coming tomorrow morning? 6.30 or 9 o'clock? I asked him, which one will have more people? And I said, 9 o'clock has hundreds of people. Uh, the 6.30 has maybe 30 people. He says, of course, I'm going to come to the 9 o'clock. Why did I come to LA for 30 people? I want to go to 600 people. He said, do you mind coming an hour earlier, come at 8, that you should also give a speech to the small minion? I said, yes, no problem. What should I speak to them about? He told me about the importance of keeping Shabbat. I said, what? <laughs> they come to Shabbat to pray at 6.30 in the morning, next minyan, and I need to tell them about the importance of Shabbat. I didn't get the point. He said, eh, tamimata. The rabbi said, you're naive. They all go to downtown to work after shul. They come quickly early because they have to open the business at 9.30. They go quickly, make a meal, and go to the business at 10, they open. I said, Ma, they have people like this over here, they go to work. <laughs> I was feeling, I came at 8 o'clock in the morning, I gave them such a speech about Shabbat. Do you believe me that from the 30 people that were there, nobody left the shul until Saturday night? They didn't go to work, <laughs> except one. One guy. Like I, like I talk to the wall. Get out, get into his Mercedes and drove. But nobody else left. They all stayed. I said, I couldn't start the car after what I heard. Until now, I never knew what Shabbat is. Didn't know it's so severe. Now my heart doesn't let me. See, that's what I claim. People are not evil and not ungrateful and not criminals on purpose. They just ignore it. Lack of knowledge is a danger. Any more questions? The murder, you asked me how does it make sense that a, mur a murderer that made the shuba? We're talking a murderer that made the shuba. If a murderer that didn't make tshuva died, and Mechalel Shabbat that did not, did not make tshuva die, who gets a bigger punishment than Mechalel Shabbat? The Chalel Shabbat gets a bigger punishment in this world and in the next world. If, did you know that if you, in Israel there was gangsters that Shomer Shabbat? If, if you murder on Shabbat. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell me if such a sense of evil. <laughs> good, good. Wow. Yeah. I think you have to tell them the punchline about your cousin. What did he tell you before you left about being right? Ah, so my cousin asked me, do you believe in the Ten Commandments? I say yes. He said, you know, according to the Ten Commandments, you are worse than Yasser Arafat. I said, mommy, are you comparing me to this mass murderer? He said, what sin he commits? Murder. What sin you commit? 
Chalel Shabbat. No, what's the comparison, I say? How do you compare this to this? He said, I don't compare. The creator of the world does, not me. It's written in the Ten Commandments. Mechalel Shabbat comes before you should not kill and has a bigger punishment. So I said, in that case, I don't believe in the Ten Commandments. Ah, I found an easy way out. Live in a dream. So you believe or you don't believe, it doesn't change your future. Go to a seminar, three days, and you, they will prove to you that the Torah is 100% divine, and then you make a decision. So he told me like this, look, let's look at my situation and your situation. Both of us right now happy from our life. You in America, I was a businessman back then. You in a bank, in banking, you do business, you make money, look at you with your tie. You live in a nice apartment. So you enjoy life. And I enjoy life here in Yeshiva with my wife and my religious kids. We have wonderful family and I have students and I enjoy learning Torah. I'm very happy and you are very happy. One day we both die and we become sad. So we are equal. We enjoy life and we became sad. That's if you are right. But if I am right, and we both gonna die one day, I go to eternal heaven with unbelievable pleasure. You cannot even imagine. The Torah said, no pleasure in this world combined of all the people, of all the generation cannot be equal to one hour of the reward of the righteous Jews in the afterlife. It's a clear verse. יפה שעה אחת של קורת רוח בעולם הבא מכל חיי העולם הזה. Unbelievable. So I go to the greatest place and enjoy for eternity with my soul, and you go to the worst place and suffer for eternity. Is it worth it for you to check? Go and check. How can you just go like that and take the risk? And that got me very scared. If not, that means I would be very stupid. Smart person gets scared. Why people walk with masks? They're afraid to die. It's not convenient. It's terrible. It's a torture. It's worse to die or to be in a hospital two months. Cannot breathe. Our Hashem, now things relax. But you remember, in the first few months, wow, I was afraid to touch the door, opening with my elbow. You know what happened. Why? All of a sudden, everyone became religious. Everyone became religious. Why? Because everyone is afraid to die. When there is a fear, people react. Fear, by the way, it's not a problem. I don't know why people are always against fear. Fear is one of the best tools in life to succeed. <coughs> if you're afraid of drugs because you see what's the end of the heroin addict, your life will get saved. If you're afraid to be a thief because you see in America they'll put you four years in prison, federal prison, because it's not Israel there, you're gonna eat uh, hummus. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so over the, so you're afraid to steal. And you're afraid not to pay taxes. And you're afraid to do a lot of things, and that saves your life. Those who were not afraid suffer for the rest of their life. When I was a kid, I had a cousin. He was a thousand. You know thousand? There used to be movies, thousand, jumping to the lake. So my cousin used to imagine that he's Tarzan. <laughs> so my, his father was a very proud man. And he used to make fun at me by coming to my mother and say, your, your, your son is such a coward. Look at my son. And the brave he is. Jump! <laughs> Jump! <laughs> you see! Jump! No, 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 no. Jump, you coward! No! Then my mother said to me, why are you <clears throat> such a coward? <laughs> <laughs> I told her, as a, as a, I was maybe 12, 13, I told her, I'd rather be a coward and stay alive and not paralyzed than this fool who jump and God forbid will die or will be paralyzed. What is it gonna give me to jump? Maybe there's a rock underneath. My head's gonna hang, bang into that, will crush my spine. What will I gain by jumping? Zero. I can only be paralyzed on a wheelchair for six years as a kid. What is it going to give me? You pay me a million dollars to jump, maybe I'll consider it. Just for the show off. Right? 
right or wrong? Everything in life is common sense. When you know the book of God, you've become familiar with that, there's no greater common sense than the divine logic. He made you, he made the world, he told you what's right and what's wrong. And whatever you disagree with him, adjust your opinion to his. He said it's not allowed men with men. It's not allowed. It's abomination. The whole world wants to change nature now. They want all men to be together, all women to be together and destroy the world. So they declare a war against the Creator. Just because it's in style doesn't make it right. Just because you're the only person who stand up in front of everyone and say, Rabotai, it's abomination, it's a death penalty in the Torah, it's not a joke. All these gays will suffer a lot from what they do. Ah, you fanatic, you crazy. They can scream until tomorrow. I did not make the rules. I'm just telling you what the book of God say. You want to hear it? Fine. You don't want to hear it, you'll deal with the consequences <laughs> later. Make sense or no? So it's time to wake up. Thank you very Thank much you again for this wonderful night. I hope it makes an impact. Continue to listen. Download my app, Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi. You have it for free. It's blue with the Star David, my app. Download it to your phone. You can hear one and a half times faster, two times faster. <laughs> and three hours become only an hour and a half. So you don't have to suffer. Thank you very much. Baruch Adonai Amen. 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 Amen.